I'm Jason Peacock, and today I'm taking a look at Codex Card Time Strategy from Serlin Games. So we get yet another two-player card dueling game to choose from. This one is supposed to emulate a real-time strategy game like Warcraft, and that's the game's biggest failure because it doesn't give me that feeling at all. But that's okay. If you like games like Ashes or Mage Wars or Star Wars Destiny, Magic the Gathering, or any other dueling card game, you might want to see how this one plays. Before I get into the gameplay, let me explain the different sets in this game. There's the super expensive deluxe set, which comes in a huge box, and it has everything for the game, binders for all six colors, and it's got these map cards that are inclusive only to that. Then there's the other retail stuff. You have the starter set, that's two one hero um, gray magic heroes uh, with some fold out patrol zones. Then there's the core set, which has two binders. It has uh, green and red full three hero color sets with all the necessary chits. And then there's two expansion packs that have the other four colors, two colors each. However, they don't have the binders for these two colors. Urgh. So, let me just explain how the game plays, and then I'll come back and tell you what I think. So, this is the starting setup. Each team has their three heroes right here. This is just their reserve zone. They're not actually in play when they're up here. We've got our draw discard pile over here. This blue zone is the patroller zone. I think of it as like the top of the castle wall and everything back here is behind your wall and your base. The object is to reduce the enemy's base down to zero. The bases each start with 20 health. Right here just shows the different turn phases. So ready upkeep is the first thing that happens during a game. If somebody has attacked, this is where we're gonna straighten them out so they're available to attack again. Um, some tokens might have to get off, come off, and cards, some cards will activate on the upkeep phase. Then you got your main phase. I'll explain that in a second. That's where you're, we're, uh, putting guys into play and attacking. And then discard and draw. However many cards you have left in your hand, you're going to discard. Similar to other deck builders like Star Realms. And then you're going to draw whatever you discarded plus two to a max of five. This here is your worker area. The player who goes first starts with four workers and second player starts with five. Your workers are gonna give you one gold per worker at the start of your turn during the upkeep. So I would just take five gold from the bank. You can just set aside 20 gold per player because you can never have more than that uh, saved up between turns. So I would get four if I went first. All right, these are your tech one, tech two, tech three buildings. Now this is where things start getting a little bit complicated. It's a very easy rule set, but there's a lot going on. So each color has their codex. This is a binder that has each of the heroes uh, school of magic. So right here, we've got the Strength hero, the Discipline hero, and the Ninjutsu hero. So this is all of the Discipline hero's magic. There's uh, there's magic and then an ultimate spell. Only your specialized guy can cast that particular type of magic. This is the first hero, this is the second hero stuff, that whole page, and this one, and the third hero. So each hero has 12 different cards with two copies each. That's the same right across the board. Every hero has 24 cards. And every color has its own 10 card starting deck. These decks are unique to the color. You're gonna draw five of them to start. You're gonna put cards into play based on what their gold cost is here. Nice and simple. Back to the codex. You can see once you get beyond just the magic spell, we have different units, like here is a Strength Tech 1 unit. Here is a Strength Tech 1. Once you complete your Tech 1 building, then you can start putting these Tech 1s into play. And then you've got 
a couple of Tech 2s, and then finally one Tech 3. Now at the point in the game when Tech 3 creatures start to come out, the game is usually not far from being over. So, so back to the Tech buildings on the board. Once I have six workers in play, I can spend one gold and start constructing the building. It doesn't finish construction until the end of the round, but then I can cast Tech 1 units of all three different types of magic in your deck. Once you have eight workers, it's going to cost four gold, and you can build your Tech 2 building. Now you have to specialize. Each magic type has cards representing. When you go to Tech 2, you are going to specialize, and only that one one of the three schools of magic will let you get tech two or greater units from that deck. So really you're only going tech two and three with one of the three types. So that leads to interesting choices on where you choose to specialize, depending on who you're fighting and what the other player is doing can make that decision for you. You also can't have two heroes in, into play until you get your tech two building built, and you can't have all three of your heroes in play at the same time until you build your tech three building. Now there's a little bit of a cheat for having more than one specialty. The other type of a building is an add-on, and there is a selection of different add-ons. You've got a surplus, which lets you draw an extra card at upkeep. That's the health and that's the cost. These things can be attacked just like a base or anything in the behind the castle gate. If any of these add-ons get destroyed, it does two damage to your base. If you purposely destroy your own add-on, just so you can put a different one in play, you're also going to do two damage to the base. So there's the four different types of buildings. Uh, Tech Lab will let you specialize in a second type. Uh, that's a popular one. Most of the people I play end up getting that of all the add-ons. Uh, Surplus lets you draw an extra card, which is nice. A Tower is cool because it's going to detect one dude that's trying to run across your wall being invisible or stealthy, like ignoring, ignoring your guards. So a tower puts up a detector and it can catch some uh, invisible dudes. And then a hero's hall, you can have an additional hero in play. That kind of explains how everything works. So we're in our main phase. We're gonna draw our cards. So we're starting with five. If I wanna cast any magic spells, like white magic, I've gotta have one of my white heroes in play. So on my first turn, I'm definitely gonna hire a worker. One of the things you do, you spend one gold, Take any one of your cards, you put it face down, it is now a worker. It's also good for culling your deck and getting rid of cards that you don't necessarily want to start drawing up. So on the next turn, I'm going to be doing getting five gold at the start of my turn. They recommend in the rules that you should try and do this every round. So then I'm just playing, um, then I'm just playing a uh, card. So this is a unit. This guy's an age sense, sensei. I guess he's a monk, he'd cost me one gold, he'd be in play. Units cannot attack the turn they come into play, which is common with these types of games, unless they have haste, which is also a common rule in these types of games. I spent two on a, on a unit and a worker, and I'm going to save the rest of the money, my money. These two will get discarded. I will draw three plus two, so I'll have five cards. The more you spend during your turn, the weaker you're going to be on your next turn. At the end of your turn, before you... Uh, add cards to your deck, you can slot guys up into here. This is called your patrol zone. This is the guys that are gonna defend against, defend your base on your opponent's turn. You have to kill everybody in the patrol zone before you can attack anything else. Once you deal with the patrollers, anything else is game. You can attack their base, you can attack their tech labs, you can attack their units that are back here. It's a really cool rule. The squad leader spot right here has to be dealt with first. He's got this taunt ability, and he gets an extra shield to absorb the first attack he takes that round. The guy here is going to get one attack when he's defending. If this guy dies, we get a gold. If this guy dies, we get a card. This guy here, you got to spend a gold if you want to target it with a spell or an ability. So once I'm done uh, casting dudes and spells... I lock everybody I want into my patrol zone. If I attack with someone, they cannot patrol for me. So you got to choose who to leave back. Then I'm going to go through my deck. And very similarly to a game called Mage Wars, you can take absolutely any two cards out of here, and then you add them face down onto your discard pile. 
so your opponent can't see what you picked. You have to tech two cards until you get up to 10 workers, and then it's optional to do. And then the other player goes, and that's how you play Codex. So that's Codex. I remember being addicted to Magic the Gathering back in 93, when my dad's friendly local game store brought in some boxes of alpha and some starters. Magic is an amazing game, but the constant releases and collectability burn me out after several years of playing. And I'm always searching for a game that'll give me a similar feel. So I love this game and it's a top 25 game for sure. Possibly top 10, possibly top five. So let me break it down. The components, the card art is great and the card quality is high, but the rest of the chits and everything is underwhelming. It doesn't draw anyone in. It's very drab looking. The board is okay, but the tokens, just don't pop. One thing that really bugged me buying the non-deluxe set to get all of the game is only the core set colors had binders. So if you wanted to play a different color, you had to take everything out of one binder, take another one and put it in. I thought this was a terrible decision. I had to order the binders separately from Serlin Games website and this option wasn't even available at first. It was only mass outrage that Serlin decided to start doing this. So I had to buy four binders and get them shipped to the States just so I didn't have to do that. But moving on to gameplay, this is where it shines. So let's look at the deck building aspect. Every color has a base 10 card starting deck. Those 10 cards are different with every color. At the end of your turn, you're adding two cards from your binder or codex to your discard pile. This is my favorite iteration of deck building. I like that there isn't a central market and it becomes all skill because you're choosing exactly what you want to put in your deck. This is one of the game's most beautiful aspects, especially when you're familiar with all the different decks, being able to add the cards from your Konex to counter what your opponent is doing is very rewarding when your plan comes to fruition. Magic the Gathering and similar games complicate things with instants and interrupts, but in this there is absolutely nothing that you can play or do while it's your opponent's turn, other than some passive abilities, like if a guy has anti-air, he's gonna do a damage to a guy flying over him. This is great for keeping it streamlined. It also lets you focus on what you're gonna be doing on your next turn. This is a great opportunity to start looking through your codex and maybe start getting a plan in motion. I like the free flow form of the main phase. You spend money doing stuff, maybe you hire one worker, bring monsters into play, cast some spells, level up a hero, or bring a hero into play. Then one guy at a time, you can just start attacking. When you're done, you discard, you draw, and then you're looking in your binder for two cards to add and your opponent has started his turn. My biggest problem with these types of games, like Magic, The Gathering, and Star Wars Destiny, Dice Masters, is the collectability. I hate feeling like the person who spent the most money gets the best deck. So I love that everything for this game is inclusive and there is nothing else for it. This is a complete game. Once you get all the different colors, you've got everything there is ever going to be. Now that's not to say there isn't tons of content. With three heroes per color, and only one of those three schools of magic going to tech two or higher, there is a huge variety of matchups. Now I've played this game a bunch, but I've just stuck to the colors, but once you know the game inside and out, or sooner, you can even mix and match the heroes from different colors, and there is rules for that. I could probably play this game another hundred times before I even think about doing that. Another benefit to being an inclusive set is that we don't have to worry about power creep, as it's called. This is where new expansions slowly start to get more powerful and they end up unbalancing earlier sets. This is a game where better players will come out on top. For the most part, the decks just follow your typical stereotypes. Red is the one with the fireballs and lightning bolts. Green is full of creatures. Black is undead with zombies and stuff like that. And I can say that I like playing every deck. They all play and feel completely different, but the purple deck 
is my favorite. This is the time traveler magic. There's units that are coming from the future and you got to keep putting tokens on them uh, until they fade back to where they came from. There's units that are coming from the past. They're in play, but they're not technically there for a couple of rounds. It's the most original deck and my favorite to play. So now let's talk about the balance of the game. This is another achievement in the game. Now I'm speaking from around 20 plays. The balance of all the different matchups has been wonderful. The balance I feel when I'm playing this game is why I really respect the design. I'll play this game anytime. I taught it to my wife and we started off with the one hero games. I highly recommend starting out this way. Even though the rules are straightforward, the three hero games have an overwhelming amount of options. And I can't think of a better way to learn the game than just do one hero versus one hero. And you know what? One versus one hero games are awesome too. My wife is dominating most games we play, which is great, but she won't deviate from her green deck. And I keep hopping around all the different ones. I don't spend too much time studying every different card in the codex. And that brings me to what could be a problem with the game. If you need to study all your different options and make the perfect move when you're adding cards from your codex to your deck, this analysis paralysis can really drag the game on. Granted, this becomes less of a problem once you become familiar with the decks, but that can take a lot of playing. If you are happy to just push the buttons to keep the flow of the game going, this issue probably won't affect you. The rulebook is very well written. You can tell they put a lot of consideration into this. There are a ton of questions on the BGG forums, but I have not had to look anything up yet. The rulebook is laid out perfectly and the answers are easy to find. And they do the best thing a rulebook can do. They dedicate a page or two to a sample turn and they explain why everybody's doing something. It's great. It reminds me of Mage Wars, which is the best rulebook ever for a complicated game that I've come across. So, as you can probably tell, this is a huge recommendation from me. If you are a Magic the Gathering fan, this might be up your alley. If you like the idea of magic, but it seems like a bit much to jump into this, this might be the perfect thing. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. I'm Jason Peacock. Check me out on social media right here, and I will see you next time. Thanks. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.